Production funding for Raised is provided by It is my pleasure to introduce Lorenzo Dickerson, a filmmaker and a photographer and the founder of Mop and Town Media, a company that creates documentary films that focus on sharing stories of African American history and culture in Virginia. A native of Charlottesville slash Albemarle County, Lorenzo earned a BBA in business management and MBA in marketing from Strayer University. He got started as a filmmaker sharing the stories of his own family, including the experience of being enslaved at Castle Hill Plantation, their participation in the Great Migration, attending a historic Rosenwald School, and desegregating Albemarle County Public Schools. His dedication to community work in the Charlottesville area was rewarded with a 2019 uh, Community Leadership Award from the Chamber of Commerce and Leadership Charlottesville. Lorenzo now serves on the Board of Directors at Charlottesville's Paramount Theater and Preservation Piedmont, as well as on VPM's Community Advisory Board. Next, we have Jordi Yeager. <laughs> Jordi Yeager is a journalist based in his hometown of Charlottesville where he currently serves as the Digital Humanities Fellow at the Jefferson School African American Heritage Center. There, he helped launch the African American Oral History Project, as well as the Mapping Seaville and Mapping Albemarle Projects, the region's first comprehensive mapping of every property record containing a racial covenant. And there were quite a lot of them. <laughs> His journalism has appeared in local publications, such as Vinegar Hill Magazine and Charlottesville Tomorrow, and national outlets such as NPR and The New Yorker. It has also won multiple first place awards, including Best in Show from the Virginia Press Association, the Virginia Association of Broadcasters, and the, the Society of Professional Journalists. And last and certainly not least, uh, please welcome Justin Reed, who will be moderating this talk. Justin Reed is a cultural organizer and public historian specializing in rural cultural sustainability, black cultural rights and memory, and the long civil rights and educational history of South Central Virginia. He was raised in Farmville, where his family were litigants in the US Supreme Court's 1964 Griffin decision, outlawing local massive resistance to school desegregation. A half century later, Justin directed the opening of the Moton Museum's national award-winning permanent exhibition on his community's civil rights era activism. As a consultant and strategist, Justin works with local communities, policymakers, organizations, and media to advance decolonizing storytelling and place-based learning. He is a co-founder of the William and Mary Lemon Project on Race, Public History and Memory, a former founding board member of the annual Virginia Children's Book Festival, and currently serves on the state boards of the Center for Nonprofit Excellence and the Virginia Tourism Corporation. So thank you all. I will pass you your own mics. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Test, test. And, and thank you, Elizabeth, for, for all the, the work you, you put into today's event. Um, we're incredibly grateful. I um, also wanted to recognize uh, Randall Taylor, who, so Rand, Randall, you were, you were the editor? Can you, can, yes, I was the yeah. Okay, so we, we magician. Yeah, so we, we'll likely be calling on, on Randall as well to answer some of these, these questions um, that I have. But um, just to get things started, you know, Lorenzo and, and Jordy, I think one of the things that really, um, I guess, inspires me about this work is that the two of you are documenting your, your home community. You know, these are folks you know, these are folks you grew up around. What was it about the story that you, you felt like needed additional telling? You know, what, what were the missing pieces that you wanted to tell to this film? I mean, I, I assume that this is something that is widely known, or maybe it isn't in Charlottesville. What, what, what led you to make this particular film? Um, 
<laughs> so for me, um, growing up in Charlottesville, my aunt and uncle, they owned uh, the, the first black-owned beauty supply store in Charlottesville, and it was located in the former Vinegar Hill. So this is 1990s at this point. And my uncle would always tell me stories about going, my great uncle would tell me stories about going to Vinegar Hill, going to the pool hall and going to the store. And it was, it was always positive stories that he was telling. Um, but then the last, say, five to seven years or so, um, the story of Vinegar Hill has come up a lot more frequently in Charlottesville. And typically, it's just a story of destruction. Uh, we never hear about the lives of the folks that live there. Um, so when this opportunity came, uh, Jordy and I had actually already talked about um, doing this film and telling the story. Um, and it just seemed like a good fit for this partnership with VPM. Yeah, I mean, there's certainly coming through the Charlottesville City School System, there wasn't any mention of Vinegar Hill um, in any of the classroom settings. Um, it was only in real life, in interactions with people we knew or, or uh, my family knew. and Or, or um, yeah, there were, there were occasionally, I think, some family members, some extended family members who would share personal stories um, of growing up in Vinegar Hill. And this, it didn't resonate because there was no body of literature, there was no film, there was no, nobody was teaching it to be able to hold this up against and say, oh, this is what you're talking about. And so it kind of lived in this kind of ethereal context of this history that existed, but you didn't, you didn't, have, a, didn't have a place for it. Um, there was a short film that was done, I think, um, maybe 10, 15 years ago. Um, it was probably a 20-minute film. Um, maybe, maybe not even that, um, but it was it was a short series of interviews with uh, folks um, that had lived in Vinegar Hill, or I guess one person who had lived there, but multiple people who had had heard about it and grown up around it. So that there was that, and then there was a seminal book that was written um, by uh, Renee Shackelford and James Saunders that really looked at. Uh, deep oral histories. In fact, the oral histories that we were able to have access to uh, from 1980, uh, it, that was the class that James Saunders taught at UVA. His students went out into the community and conducted those interviews on cassette tapes. Um, and we, we got access to those interviews plus some additional ones. Um, and we digitized those and were able to pair them with uh, their descendants and people, you know, across generations to be able to have that, you know, multi-generational conversation. Um, but th those were the two, uh, that short film and the, and the book were really the, the two existing materials that were out there. And so when we were discussing films that we felt like should have been made by now and, and needed to be made, this was very much at top of the list. Um, you know, Vinegar Hill, of course, was not the only community that was destroyed, um, but it was, it was the largest. Um, and so I think our intent also was to try to, uh, try to tell the story in some other way about uh, the other communities that were destroyed. And so I think that's still a project that we want to get into. But um, certainly for Vinegar Hill, nobody had told that century of life before the destruction. And so that destruction was really deeply embedded as the narrative of what Vinegar Hill, it became synonymous with Vinegar Hill was, was this destruction. Um, but for 100 years, you know, it was the center of economic activity, it was the center of social life, religious life, benevolent organizations, insurance companies, funeral homes, you name it. I mean, it was, as you saw, it was, um, and so wanting to make sure that that wasn't like a second erasure, I think was really a driving force. Okay, so, and this is something I'm, I'm grappling with as well in, in, in my own family. I mean, they, they, there are stories that you would think the next generation would know. And, you know, as an adult, I'm just now learning about, you know, certain things that have happened. Like, why do you think that is? I mean, especially for you, Lorenzo, having relatives who were part of this vibrant community, why, why don't, why do you feel as if that, that story wasn't really discussed? Yeah, I think, you know, in my experience, like with my family members and other folks in the community, um, in my experience, the stories are never told until you ask the right question. Um, I've, you know, done hundreds of interviews and a lot of times, Folks in the community will, when you reach out to them about a particular story, they'll say, I, I don't have anything to share. I don't remember anything. Um, they remember a whole lot. <laughs> they either are, you know, they just don't want to talk about it. They're, uh, they don't want to be on camera. That's, you know, a lot, especially for the elder, elder community. Uh, or they don't think that they know anything. They, they don't think they remember anything. They're focused on today and what they have to do tomorrow and that sort of thing. 
Um, so if you're able to just get in front of them and ask them the right questions, then all this this world of knowledge comes out. Um, but it's it can be hard sometimes to to get in front of people. Jordy, you were nodding. I mean, I guess. Yeah, I mean, the countless stories that Lorenzo has shared with me about, like, you talking to, I don't know, your aunts or, you know, like, a family member, and you've known them your whole life, and then you'll be telling them or relaying some other story that you're working on, and they'll be like, oh, you mean, you, you know, Eugene Dickerson down the street? You know, like, that's what it is. It's like, oh, wow, and it just pops up. And it happens all the all time, the where you do all this research, this background research, find out this information, and then you tell the elders in the family, and they're like, Oh yeah, yeah, we knew that. Like, of course. I'm like, why didn't you tell me that? <laughs> well, you didn't ask, right? <laughs> right exactly. <laughs> well, then that, that I guess takes me to another question I have is really about the process. So, did you do the interviews first? Did you do the research first, and then try to follow up with the interviews? Can you talk a little bit more about what it was like, and maybe how long it took, and maybe kind of walk us through this journey of of making raised and raised. Um. A lot of making this film kind of fell into place um, without any doing of, of Jordy and I. I think we really, we started off, Jordy had the list of names of, of folks that lived in Vinegar Hill through the research. Um, because we're from Charlottesville, some of those names, those surnames are recognizable. Um, so there were times where we would, you know, just reach out to someone that we knew that may be you know, 40 years old, 50 years old, and you know, are, is this person, does this person happen to be a relative of yours? Like, sure, that's actually my grandparent. Um, you all saw Waki Wynn in the film. He was more towards the end. Um, he's the one that said, my ceiling is my son's floor. And when we reached out to him, he didn't know that his grandparents lived in Vinegar Hill. Um, we knew Waki, so we reached out um, because we knew the last name, and sure enough, those were his grandparents that lived in Vinegar Hill, and he didn't know until we reached out to him and gave him that information. Yeah, and there there are four giant kind of you know lawyer boxes uh, fills, uh, filled with information um, at the local historical society that nobody had really combed through, and these are all the the legal filings uh, surrounding uh, urban renewal in Charlottesville. Um, and so one of the first thing Lorenzo and I did was just spent, you know, probably several weeks, if not months, just culling every piece of information, going through uh, newspaper clippings, going through uh, these boxes full of, uh, of actual legal and government archives, going through the oral histories, you know, digitizing things, pulling transcripts, um, just to see the entirety of what was out there before we even had that very first conversation, because you want to know you want to know kind of the, the arena into which you're stepping with that conversation because these people are bringing a whole lifetime of history into that. In the very least, you want to be able to kind of meet them uh, somewhat where they are with that conversation. Um, and I mean, really, that's the genius behind Randall's work too is that uh, when we met Randall and, and it got introduced. Randall, like, did you just like, he's like, absolutely not. I'm not dealing with all this stuff y'all are bringing me. Because <laughs> like, we like? had so, I mean, one of the best compliments that you paid us, I think, Randall, is that there was no shortage of material, right? That like, there was, there was, uh, it was just a matter of where it all fit and how it all fit. Um, and that that's, that's, yeah, that, that, that made us, I think, really proud of kind of that research element that we had dug deep. Um, and I know we'll talk about this more, but it, it does lend itself to that reparations conversation that, as Waki said, you know, this isn't rocket science. We know who all of these people are, right? We know all of the prices that were paid. We know all of the numbers, all of the details that make reparations always a stopping point for white leaders is is off the table now. Like with this research, there's no reason why it can't proceed. And this the process took we started discussing this film with VPM April of twenty twenty. Um and then it it premiered April of 2022, um, so um, about two years of, of work on this project. And like like Jordy said, we had so much material to work with through the interviews and the newspaper clippings and you know the archival audio um, footage and whatnot. And Randall was able to really put that put that together. We we wrote the script and we got it to Randall and. Um, there was so much <laughs> to get to Randall <laughs> on these drives, um, but Randall was really able to, to to bring it all together in a in a cohesive way that made sense um, for the viewer to be able to watch. And 
Randall, I'm curious. I mean, you know, you you've grown up in the Richmond area. You know, you had two Charlottesville natives who were bringing a project to you that's very personal for a lot of different reasons. How do you then tell them this has to be cut? Like these, you know, these clips. Like, like what is what is that like? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we. Yeah, we had we, yeah, we, 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 yeah, we had this conversation. <laughs> Good, yeah. good. Yeah, so yes, yes, yeah. Yes. yeah, so please, yeah, what, what, what was that like? And how, how do you make those types of decisions, especially with a project that is you know, so close to home, literally, right, for the two filmmakers that were working with you? I, I think um, the biggest thing was, like they've already said, there was so much material that they provided, so much research they had done ahead of time. For me, when I first came in, my, my first, the very first thing I did was I watched everything. I watched the interviews. I went through, you know, all the documents, tried to organize things, tried to, you know, watch interviews and try to pick out, you know, you know, important points, important things that people were saying. Um, and I think when it, to answer your question, when it comes to cutting it down, it is hard to decide what to include, what not to include. Um, thankfully, they had a great script <laughs> to work from. Um, but even then, um, as I was going back through and looking at the interviews, I always found, I was like, oh, this is interesting right here. We should add this in. We should add this in. And, and the thing is, I feel like when you're, when you're making a film, um, the, the hardest thing is to choose what not to include uh, because there's so much there. And then with filmmaking or with documentary filmmaking especially, you're telling the, you, you want to do justice to the stories that the people are sharing with you. You want to make sure you're being as, uh, being as authentic as you can with telling their stories. And all of the stories that were told were important because those were lived experiences that they had, that the ancestors had, and you want to make sure that you're doing justice to that. And that, I think, is the hardest part, is making sure that you are yeah, exactly, right, you, you, that you're just, you're making sure that what you're putting together is going to be something that they are, for one, comfortable with, right? You don't want to, like you said, misrepresent them, but at the same time, you want to tell an accurate story and paint a clear picture for the viewer as well, so. Now, are, are there things that didn't make the film that, you know, you're thinking right now, you really wish <laughs> have included? I'm curious to, to hear, what, what, what were some of the things that that weren't included. <laughs> I, mean, I think I think the first thing that comes to mind is uh, you know, like Randall describing all of these very deeply personal stories that people are sharing. There's a lot of names that are are very well known and and very important to Lorenzo and I. Just having grown up there, we know these names very very well, but we don't have the time to lay the context for every single name and every single thing that these people have done, which are, are monumental. And so we had to like really decide, okay, you know, if we're going to represent, you know, the religious presence in Vinegar Hill, there's five black churches. We only focused on one because how do you could make a whole film about five black churches, right? Like that a whole series, <laughs> right? Like and so and so those are the tough kinds of decisions where you had to let one entity really speak for multiple um, and hope that, that you, you weren't shorting or sliding anybody as a result. Making you know, this film the primary audience because it was in partnership with VPM, uh, the, the initial audience being for television, we had to edit it in a way um, that was meant for television, knowing that people all across the state of Virginia would watch it. And I think that's what Jordy's talking about. We know these names, we we have these, you know, we know these things, but for someone that is from Richmond or from wherever, we we're looking at it now through this lens. It's like, ah, oh, they might not get that that piece. So unfortunately, we can't include it, even though we think it's so good. Yeah. And, and from someone being from Richmond, and I didn't know about this before I was approached to work on this project, um, I had been to the Vinegar Hill area before. I'd been to the Staples <laughs> a few times, you know, in that, that parking lot. Um, and I had driven past there, or, you know, bunches of times when I visited Charlottesville, but I had no idea. And I think 
the nice thing about this film, which it touches on it at one point, is that this was happening all across the country. So like this film can be shown anywhere, and because you have these these stories from these individuals who lived there, who experienced it, who had ancestors that lived there, I think anyone watching this anywhere else can relate and they can say, oh wow, this happened in my neighborhood, or did this happen in the, the neighborhood that I'm living in now, right? What am I, what, 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 what uh, the streets I'm walking on, what happened here before I'm here, before I was here, right? Um, and I think that's something that um, is, 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 is something that this film um, does a great job in, in illustrating for other people in other areas in this country. Um, so. I think that was one of the first things I said after seeing this film. I said, okay, now I need you to come to my hometown and, and do a similar film. Uh, members of my own family have, have been displaced because of urban renewal that happened just an hour you know, outside of Charlottesville. So right, this is something that many people, unfortunately, can, can see themselves in because of what's happened to our, our relatives and, and our ancestors who experienced urban renewal. And not to, just to, one more thing is like right, right, right down the street is Jackson Ward. I have my my family, my grandmother had a home here. It's no longer there anymore because of things that have happened in the past, decisions that the city made, you know, the highway that's going through uh, downtown. Um, Navy, Navy Hill. Yeah, Navy, yeah, Navy Hill, exactly, exactly. And so um, she had a beauty salon. It's no longer there, right? And I didn't learn this until maybe six years ago. And I'm 36 years old. I went my whole life not knowing this until we were sitting down having a conversation with my mom and we were going looking on Ancestry and like putting the family tree together and we were just having discussions and talking about these things and there you go. They, my, my grandmother was a business owner. Never knew that, you know? So, um, yeah. What, what has the, the local reaction? I know you all had a premiere in Charlottesville. It really had like, like a thousand people. This was a, this was a big event you know, outdoors, you know, film premiere, you know, what has the local reaction been like in Charlottesville? I, I would hope, right, everybody's now on the same page. Everybody's like doubling down on their efforts, right, to, to right these wrongs and, 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 and you know, uh, create some type of, of restitution. They've learned their mistakes, right? That's not, that's. <laughs> well, okay, then what is, what is happening then in Charlottesville? Like, so what, yeah, what has the response been? And, and, in, What's going on now? In in that sense, there's, def there's definitely still um, work to do. It's it's created greater awareness. Um, so for teachers and K-12 teachers and um, professors at the University of Virginia and that sort of thing. So um, you know, there's one particular professor at UVA that is uh, doing a unit on Vinegar Hill based on this film as we speak, matter of fact. Um, and then other teachers in K-12, which is great. So students are learning more um, about this history. Now, as far as the city is concerned, um, that's a bit of a different story. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, I think the city is comfortable ignoring it for the most part. And, and by that, I mean the leadership of the city, um, but also, you know, big money that, that has interest and buys interest within the city. Um, so, I mean, you know, this has been discussed before, but it's the commodification of history, right? So, so people in power and people in government will lean on history to support whatever causes or whatever aspirations they particularly have, uh, as long as it suits them. But when it starts to become uncomfortable or, or to not mesh with those aspirations, um, then it's ignored and easily ignored. Um, and so, so yeah, the conversation of reparations has not been raised outside of conversations around this film um, in any sort of meaningful way. I think part of that is, you know, something that got mentioned in the film that when Vinegar Hill was raised, it, it, it not only displaced people geographically, but it, it, it broke apart their ability to make common cause um, and to organize, right? That, that neighborhood associations were one of the first lobbying forms that city residential life took. Um, and and so who has that capacity if you no longer live next to your neighbor? Um, you know, so one of the things that we're doing at the African American Heritage Center at, in, at, that's based in the Jefferson School in Charlottesville is to form an advisory panel, advisory board of past and present historically and current 
uh, black neighborhoods. So the neighborhoods that no longer exist in their current, in their past iterations, uh, Vinegar Hill, Gospel Hill, McKee Row, Pearl Street, uh, Friendship Court, the, the Garrett Street area, um, all of these will have representation next to historically black neighborhoods that are now being displaced through gentrification and modern day capitalism and the com commodification of housing. Um, and so that these are, you know, in that form, that advisory board would have the capacity to wage that campaign. Yeah, you're, re you're, re you're rebuilding meaningful a, a, a meaningful community of resistance, is what Bell Hooks said. And I didn't share this quote with you all, but you just said something that I'm going to share now because it, it, it resonates. This is uh, Bell Hooks, uh, as many of you know, you know a, a feminist scholar um, writing in 1990 about South Africa. She said, it is no accident that the South African apartheid regime systematically attacks and destroys black efforts to construct home place, however tenuous, that small private reality where black women and men can renew their spirits and recover themselves. It is no accident that this home place, as fragile and as transitional as it may be, a makeshift shed, a small bit of earth where one rests, is always subject to violation and destruction. For when a people no longer have the space to construct home place, we cannot build a meaningful community of resistance. And what I'm hearing you describe right now, we didn't discuss this before, but what I'm hearing you describe right now is, is a very intentional effort to rebuild you know, these, these meaningful communities of, of resistance, to be vigilant and be able to organize and respond and take action and follow policy. That, that, is, that is powerful. Uh, I'm, I'm really glad to, to hear that. Um, what I'm hearing now also is that there, there are many things that could be done even before you get to, you know, quote unquote, reparations. I mean, I know there's, there's a rezoning process underway right now in Charlottesville. Has this film influenced some of those conversations? I think so. I mean, yes, in, in some ways. I mean, for me, I don't know how you feel, Lorenzo, but like, for me, I feel like the the lessons of urban renewal, the mistakes of urban renewal can just as easily be repeated today uh, without any, you know, it doesn't take a Truman or a 1949 Housing Act to, to create the mistakes that urban renewal did. So I'm, I'm real leery and wary of, you know, when people start talking about specific policies that all of a sudden have, you know, for instance, there's, there's a bike and pedestrian, uh, there's a push to make cities very bike and pedestrian friendly. Um, who is pushing that agenda, right? And I say agenda, not like a conspiracy, but like who, are people asking the people most impacted by those changes what they want? And who are they, who, so who are they centering in the conversation for that change? And I don't see that happening in Charlottesville. I don't know what it's like in Richmond in terms of that conversation. But in Charlottesville, that t conversation is entire, almost entirely white. Um, and there is no desire to hear what black residents uh, want out of their urban infrastructure or how how they use streets in terms of bike and pedestrian interaction and entirely and entirely white because those those communities of black resistance have been systematically <laughs> displaced and as we've seen here in in this film um, I, I do want to let folks know if there are questions we have uh, that mic there that's available um, on, on the side of the room here uh, so what what forms could you know, reparative action take in, in your in your mind, um, and also like what are, what are some of the things that you're hearing from from uh, families who who formerly resided in Vinegar Hill? What are some of the things that um, they would like to see, and what are some of the things that you feel you know could be done? Yeah, I mean, I think um, from the the families themselves, really, um, monetary reparations is the only thing that can really. Waki went in the film talks talked a little bit at the end there about how this is more than just a neighborhood being destroyed. So now you you no longer have the ability to say send your child to college. You're not borrowing against the home. You're not able to start a new business, right? So there's a general a generational wealth um, gap there that's created. Um, by destroying this neighborhood. So we, we, when we look at it, we look at it typically as just someone losing their home. But there's so much more that comes after that, that kind of opportunity cost of what wasn't able to be realized um, because of that. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think 
you started by saying, you know, censoring kind of what residents and descendants of residents think themselves. And I think that's the first part is to to not tie any strings to any sort of, of demand um, coming out of those conversations, right? To make those solely autonomous and supported with what, whatever resources are available, whether that's state policy, federal policy, or local policy, or federal policy, um, and also and also different pools of money. Um, and so whether it's a tax on all residents, I mean, this is part of our shared history. This is our community um, history. And so we don't get to just choose the good parts, right? We have to take all of this and make amends and make, make as many repairs as we can. Um, and so it's not going to be parks or parades or street renamings or plaques and these sorts of things. Um, that, that Those are fine and symbolic in, in certain ways, but um, I think it is about land. It is about repurposing land. It is about, um, you know, you have to use the corrupt and unjust system that made this possible to actually make it right. That's the, that's the conundrum, right? And so how do, you, how do you actually get towards justice using an unjust system? Um, and that, it, but I mean, you can at least start that conversation uh, or, or those moves in that direction, I think. Um, yeah, that's on. Hello, my name is Lori Hunter. I hate that echo. Um, actually, I don't know if you know Kelly Libby, but years ago in, 90, in 2016, she came into Richmond and interviewed people in something called Unmonumental. And actually, the interview she did with me about the destruction of Navy Hill was on NPR. And um, it's like a, I just looked it up, and it's like a two, two minute, 45 second um, interview. And I was talking about how when we would drive through Ninth and Jackson, my, my mom would always say, we're driving through Mama Dear's front door. Um, so I was just wondering, based on what you just said, if you could be a mentor to communities like ours. Um, in, I was just listening to the strategy of how you used the school as a center, centering point for collecting oral histories and things like that, because um, the, the corrupt part was trying to build a casino in Navy Hill. And so we need some strategizing for what you just said on how to turn the corrupt system into um, a just system for us that descend from those whose property was taken here in Navy Hill. You know, and that's sparking, you know, this, this idea in, in my head, maybe it is for you all as well, but what are the conversations that are happening maybe across state? And is, you know, are, is there potential for you know, communities that have experienced these, you know, these similar you know, acts of urban renewal and displacement, you know, is there the potential for a statewide conversation organizing around what can be done you know, in the form of restitution? Farmville is represented right here on the stage. So like, we, you know, we're having to come, we have Richmond, Charlottesville, Farmville all represented right now, I'm, I'm sure. You know, just other possibilities. I think that was one of the things with making this film is that we hope that folks would be inspired in various communities um, all over the state or even the country um, to collectively uh, come together to do this work and learn from one another. So, um, yeah, I think we're, I mean, we're all, all for that for sure. Yeah. And I love that notion of, of, you know, I don't know that, I guess we had started to talk about it too. I mean, you're talking about this Pine Grove work that you're, you're doing down in, in Cumberland, is that right? Yeah. Um, and, and looking at how oral histories and that, that preservation of history then intersects with, for lack of a better term, activism, but, but action-oriented policymaking and, and, um, and preservation on that level too, um, which, you know, Lorenzo and I don't think of ourselves as activists, but I think as, as storytellers, it's hard not to be an activist in that sense. And so um, kind of making peace with that, but then uh, wanting to be of use as much as possible. So absolutely, 100%. I don't, you know, it's hard to, I think Charlottesville was, um, the reason why this story felt so right is that it's a story we'd known for most of our lives and we knew most of the people. And so I think part, part of what made that successful was being from that 
community. Um, and so, but and so, I think your approach to that is spot on, just in terms of you know operating kind of as as just an advisee, um, you know, but that the people who are living that are really the ones that are centered in that whole process too. Um, I think that's integral to it as well. But yeah, I mean, it's it's everywhere you go. I mean, and Justin, you're doing a lot of this work too, of of like starting to pair that history with like actual state policy. Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of things that are opening up in my brain. I mean, even just from, from watching, I, mean, I think I've seen this film probably four times at this point, and each time there are things that are kind of going off in my brain. Okay, I need to look into this. Okay, this this is a question I need to investigate, that sort of thing. So you, you are doing the work, I guess, already by sparking you know, these questions in other communities. Good evening, my name is Joyce Young, and I had a question. I was looking at the film and you mentioned the Jefferson School, you also mentioned the school, Janie Porterberry. Um, is that school still in existence? The reason I ask is because there is a correctional facility for juveniles named Jane Porter Barrett in Hanover. And I really, I guess I have to Google her name to figure out who she is. Does anyone know the rationale in that name or whether that school is still yeah, I didn't. I didn't know about the Hanover uh, school sharing that name, but uh, I know J uh, Janie Porter Barrett was a, was a pioneering uh, black woman educator um, who, uh, I forget which community she was from, um, but this school in Charlottesville, is, it, it's, still a, it's still an early learning center, right? Mm -hmm. so it moved to a different building. The original building that you saw is still there. Oh, okay. but, it, it's, but the daycare has moved to a different building, not far away. It's been walking distance. Named in her honor, I believe it's one of the oldest you know, early childhood learning centers in, in Virginia. I saw that, and yeah. it is Department of Correction Youth Services. Huh, that, that is interesting. I'm, now I'm curious to investigate that, because it's, it's just another example of you know, this, this kind of proud you know, black community history you know, being attached to something that doesn't necessarily reflect the legacy. Uh, Luxury apartments named after Maggie Walker, right? Right, 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 <laughs> right. Are there any other questions? Uh, question over here. I'll come to you. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Dolores Bailey, and um, I was wondering what, are there any plans to, what are you going to do with the data that did not make the film? So you said you had collected a lot of information um, that you could not uh, put in the film because of time limitations. So is there any, are there any plans to have that uh, displayed someplace else? Yeah, the thought is, um Actually, it was always the thought, really, because we, like you mentioned, because we had so much footage, um, was to create a website where folks can actually can visit there and see these these pieces of information that we've collected in short bites. Um, one to, to keep uh, to keep your attention for one, um, but also so you can see all the other stuff and learn from that, all the other stuff that didn't make it uh, into the film. So that's still a project to come is to make that public uh, on the website. Also, um, one more thing, uh, this is related. I, I was a member of the Reconnect Jackson Ward, which was a po project that happened uh, in Richmond where they were seeking funds to uh, build a project that would put a bridge over Jackson Ward uh, as a sim symbol of reconnecting uh, the two parts of Jackson Ward. I don't know if they received the funding or not, but there are similar, uh, there's a lot of archive of information, like uh, the woman from the, who represented the city of Richmond said that there were multiple Jackson Ward projects that never really saw the light of day, but it would be interesting to see those projects, see the information that was obtained from those projects. I know that uh, the, uh, the Reconnect Jackson Ward, they did interview some people, so they, they do have oral histories, and I assume that some of the other Jackson Ward projects also had, um, had, had oral history, and I'm assuming that in other cities, uh, in Virginia, there may be some other similar instances where uh, information has been collected from people who are no longer here. So it would be nice to have a central for repository for, for that information. Yeah, I, I, 
a wonderful idea, I think. I mean, because, yeah, the, uh, otherwise it just gets lost um, and fragmented even further. Yeah. yeah. It gets more difficult to tell the stories once it starts to, those projects start to disappear. And like you said, and the, that information starts to fragment. It gets, it gets difficult to put those pieces together years from now to be informed and tell those stories the way they should be told. Where where will this um, additional um, footage be be housed? Is is this something that would be done independently in, in collaboration with an existing organization institution? And how are you envisioning that currently? Um, more than likely, it would be uh, Moffin Town Media Jefferson School African American Heritage Center um, project. So it'd be um, you know Moffin Town produced Jefferson School would probably house it, um, but it'd be online and um, publicly available. The other thing, you know, so the African American Heritage Center that Lorenzo mentioned, I'm, I'm a fellow there, and one of the things that we're working on now is all of the land tax records in Charlottesville were segregated for the first 80 years. So from 1880 to 1960, uh, the white land tax records are in the front of the book, black are in the back. Um, with that, you have the capacity, we have the capacity to digitize all of those uh, and create the first database for land ownership um, so we can essentially get our arms around the entirety of black land ownership in Albemarle County, which is 726 square miles, and then Charlottesville, which is in the middle, of course, um, and uh, from you know 80 years, 1880 to 1960. Um, and then we have the capacity to map that, actually, in GIS, and so we can show the evolution of how historically black communities originated in, um, in different parts of the county and the city and then grew and then also looking at the forces of racial covenants of uh, you know, essentially uh, redlining in, in various parts um, and displacement uh, by other means um, to really you know, broaden that conversation for repair and reparations of you know, eminent domain urban renewal, yes, but uh, that was just one mechanism. And so how, how else has our law system conducted itself in a way that has resulted in displacement? Um, and so this is this is that broader scope and that broader sphere that uh, again will be you know in partners Lorenzo and and the the uh, in Moppin Town and the African American Heritage Center work very closely together so it's all there and connected. Uh, yes, um, have you all received any pushback on the curriculum as far as it being taught in the schools? No, actually. Um, no pushback so far. Now, right now, it's really based on individual teachers that are interested um, in the subject matter and take it upon themselves uh, to teach it to their students. So it hasn't gone into full-blown curriculum. Um, we're actually in the process of um, getting with teachers to write that curriculum. Yeah. Taking a time for one more. One more question. I'll just add too. I mean, I think similarly in Richmond and Charlottesville, you know, the school systems are encouraging, you know, this, this deeper exploration of of local history. That's given the headlines that we've seen this week, <laughs> you know, might become more difficult um, across the state. But we know, you know, in Richmond and Charlottesville, at least, there's a commitment at the local level to. to Kind of elevate these, these important but lesser known stories. Are there any other questions? Well, thank you guys so much for being here. This was fantastic. Thank you all for thank you. Thank you. <laughs>